Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, friends. My name is Gordon. I'm an alcoholic, and I'd like to thank everybody doing service in the meeting tonight, and it's great to see so many people here, 90 plus Fantastic, you know. Um, the sobriety date is the 10th of March 1999, and I have an in person home group here in Aberdeen, Scotland, on a Wednesday lunchtime at the Salvation Army. Any of you any, ever in town here, please come by and we'd be delighted to see you. And I also have a Zoom home group, the shoulder to shoulder. It's on a Tuesday and a, a Thursday night. We do a big book meet on a Tuesday and a general share on a Thursday night. And I'll, I'll pop the meeting the details in the, to the chat box for the MMT group and anybody who wants to those can can ask them for it. Yeah, share in a general way what what it was like, what happened and what it's like today, you know. I know from a very, very young age, well I have to say, I, I want to just pop this in here now as well. Where I where I come from, we normally share for about 15 or 20 minutes. So this will be interesting. <laughs> uh yeah, yeah. Um from a very young age, I was insecure. I had unfounded fears. I felt less than uh, awkward and inadequate. Now, nobody ever in my life told me I was inadequate, but I felt that way. You know, I had this hole in my soul, an internal spiritual malady from a very young age, uh, long before I started drinking alcohol. I just, I just couldn't fit in. I just, you know, it was as if everybody else in life had been given the manual for living and, and I somehow wasn't at, wasn't at school that day, you know. Um, I can remember being in primary school and sitting on the edge of the, the playground and watching all the other kids having fun and playing and wondering why I just couldn't join in, why I didn't feel part of, you know. Um, so I had this low self-worth and low self-esteem from, from a young age, you know. I just felt different and I could, I could, I didn't know why, and it was it was certainly not through lack of love. Very loving parents, uh, mother and father, loved me. I'm an only child, and uh, always had a shirt on my back and food on the table. But um, dad went out and worked. He was the breadwinner, and mum stayed at home and and looked after me. And I was I was I was loved, you know, and I feel blessed for that because I know that's not everybody's experience. But but I have to say as well is that. I looked up to my dad, I worshipped my dad, he was my hero, but um, there were a lot of things about him that I didn't understand. And I know from what I've learned in these rooms that he's not an alcoholic, he's a heavy drinker, you know. And boy, when he drank, he really drank. But I was confused as a very young lad, and, and I have to say that in no way did the way my parents behave around me or whatever cause me to be an alcoholic. You know, I have this illness and I just, there's no there's no need to, wonder why I just know today I am and uh but my dad he liked to drink you know but but I never saw him drink much of an evening it was maybe one tin of beer he did, he did a lot of secretive drinking you know and he'd go to bed he, he, he got up early in the morning he went out and worked and um of an evening he would he would go away to bed early and but he after a while of being in bed he'd come through and then he'd start arguing with my mum you know and I never understood why I never could get my hand round why this went on, and uh, and fear was instilled in me from a very young age. I can remember lying on the sofa, and uh, in the fetal position, you know, just absolutely terrified, not knowing what to do, not being able to comprehend the situation. Um, so yeah, I was I was I grew up with lots of mixed feelings, you know. Um, but like I say, I know today that my dad's just a heavy drinker because he's. His life never got unmanageable. You know, he could drink lots and lots and lots, but his life's always been manageable. I can remember the wages he used to take home again. We're talking in the 1970s when 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 men used to get paid cash in a brown envelope. And he used to come home and he had all the bills paid, he had all these envelopes and made sure that all the bills were paid, you know, so there was no unmanageability there. Um, so, yeah, I, I was mixed up. I was, I was frightened. I was, I just couldn't do life, you know. And um, I was very, very fortunate um, from primary school. Um, I would have normally went to the local comprehensive school, the local state school. That would have been the normal 
run, the, you know, the way things turned out. But I, I did okay at primary school, and I actually got a bursary. And this is where things started to come in, and I, I had this dichotomy with my feelings going on. Was I less than, or was I more than, or better than? And I actually got a bursary to go to a private school here in Aberdeen. My fees, my school fees were paid for this bursary um, for six years. And uh, boy, that, that changed things. You know, if I, if I had felt different when I was in primary school, well, going to this secondary school and no longer going to school with all the kids in my council housing estate, but with these other guys, I was really a fish out of water because I felt I could no longer pal about with the guys in my my state and I couldn't have really mixed with these the majority of people at my school who were you know very well off their parents had big cars big houses and big jobs and wonderful lives and, and very very many material things you know um but I I want to just go back a wee bit as well when I, when I was young and growing up I was I was in, it was instilled in me a lot of ethics good morals good principles the difference between right and wrong you know, my father was never a religious person, still isn't to this day, but my mum took me to church, you know, she took me to church and because I I got from her and her from her mother, um, a love of music and a passion for music, I used to like to sing sing the hymns at the church and on a Sunday morning, but as soon as the minister got up to do his sermon, I just switched off, I had absolutely no desire to learn or to listen to this person speaking about something, it was all kind of, it just did not interest me. You know, I switched off. And uh, I was also in a thing called the Boys Brigade. It was the Church of Scotland I went to. I can only talk my truth. I went to the Church of Scotland and the, in a thing called the Boys Brigade. And it was a lot of fun when you were still in primary school. But when you got to 12 years old and went to secondary school, you then went up to the senior section as opposed to the junior section, and a Bible was thrust into my hand, and I was specifically told that I had to go to church at a certain time on a Sunday, and I had to study this Bible, you know. And I can distinctly remember taking that Bible home and reading it, and every fibre of my being rejected it, just completely rejected it. And uh, I told my parents, I says, I can't do this. And they says, OK, Gordon, you don't have to. Nobody's forcing you to do anything you don't want to. And I promptly left the Boys Brigade and joined the Scouts because they had very little to do with the church. And um, it seemed more interesting anyway, the things that the Scouts did, you know. So I know that I forgo any opportunity to learn about a power greater than me at the age of 12. But like I say, years before that, I had this internal spiritual malady. And it didn't take long. I was at the age of 15. I um, engineered a situation one night. I was going out with three friends and we were going to go down to the beach here in Aberdeen. We're, we're very fortunate. We have a, a beach that's about two miles long and um, there's an amusement centre down there. And as a teenager at 15, that was that was something that would be exciting, you know. But as as the lads were coming together to meet, I got this idea that would, wouldn't it be brilliant if we got somebody older than us to buy some alcohol you know and that's just exactly what happened a guy that we had known in the scouts he was three years older than us the legal age for drinking and in the uk is 18 and this guy was 18 and he just wandered into our company just as we were preparing to set off to go into town and we asked him if he would do this and he did <laughs> and um <laughs> I walked into town. I, I, of course, took the bottle in my jacket. It was a bottle of vodka. And I uh, hadn't even had it in my system, and I felt better. The anticipation, the excitement, and what this stuff could do for me, because I'd seen, you know, people at parties and, you know, what alcohol could do for them, and I was dying to st try this stuff. And we walked down to the beach here in Aberdeen, walking down a, a, a big road called the Boulevard, and lo and behold, we bump into another guy from my class at school. And this wasn't planned. This absolutely was not planned. And unbeknown to us, he'd went into his parents' drinks cabinet and poured ev a little bit of every spirit, every alcohol spirit that was in their drinks cabinet, into his bottle. So we got down to the beach, down to the promenade, into one of these little alcoves where you could go in and sit and get a bit of shelter. And, of course, I had the lion's share of the vodka. And once it was, I can still picture me throwing it into the sea. I have a very vivid memory of throwing that empty bottle into the sea. 
But the three friends that I'd set out with originally, they didn't want any more alcohol, but I did, you know. I turned to my friend and I got I got stuck into his bottle as well. So you can imagine at the age of 15, I feel very fortunate that I'm a big lad. I've always been big, big in size. And if it wasn't for my size, probably that night, I should have been in hospital getting my stomach pumped out because of the sheer volume of absolutely neat alcohol spirits mixture as well that I'd thrown down my neck, you know. And uh, obviously within a short space of time, I just blacked out and my pals got me home, thankfully. And uh, the police even intervened at one point. I was told all this afterwards. The police intervened and my mate says, no, no, we'll get him home, we'll get him home. And they did, you know. But that that, that was <laughs> the kind of writing was on the wall <laughs> right, for, right for the start. There was no honeymoon period with this stuff. It was blackout and it was embarrassment and shame. I was sick all over these stonewashed jeans that I was wearing at the time. It was... And I remember the next morning waking up and having absolutely zero um, awareness or uh, understanding of alcoholism. My idea was, well, I just won't drink vodka. Vodka obviously doesn't agree with me. I didn't have a clue, eh? not a clue. And so I went on and I was still at school, you know, so I couldn't drink very often because I didn't have the funds to do that. But I had my first job when I was 14. I worked for the local news agent on a Saturday morning. Got a few pounds for that. And then when I was 16, I got a job in a department store. British home stores. I was working eight hours on a Saturday. I remember I got I got paid £11.34 and my driving lessons were £10 a week. So I didn't have much money to spend on myself. But at every opportunity, I drank to escape. You know, there's even at that tender age in my teens, I just... I, I, I sought that oblivion, you know. I couldn't do life. I wasn't comfortable. And I sought escape and oblivion through alcohol at every opportunity. And I can even remember when I was 17, I was still at school. It was uh, November 1986. And one Monday morning, my, my father was getting ready for work early in the morning. And I went to him, I says, Dad, I think I'm an alcoholic. I need help. And he probably looked at me as if I was, you know, from a different planet, because he wouldn't have known, because I had, you know, he, he knew I went out and drank now and again, but he didn't understand the problem um, that I had, that he 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 didn't. And um, he phoned the doctors that morning. That was, you know, like I say, back in the 80s, you, you could phone the family doctor that morning and get an appointment with your family doctor that morning. And he took the morning off work. And I'm sitting in the doctor's surgery with my mother and my father, trying to tell the family GP that I was an alcoholic and needed help. You see, but I was at this good school, you see, and uh, I wasn't drinking very often. But when I drank, I drank the blackout. And um, I was totally honest with this doctor. I told him exactly what was going on in my mind. And he says, no, you're not an alcoholic. He would give me some tablets. And, you know, if I, if I thought I had a problem with alcohol, well, maybe just perhaps try to curtail, you know, limit the amount I drank. That was kind of his, his um, solution. And I, many years ago, stopped resenting the fact that he didn't mention AA or give me the big book of AA or give me a phone number to call or anything like that. It's been my journey and it's also my truth. And um, I took this medicine and I didn't drink for six weeks. And it's the only time in my life I've been physically fit. Because I knew nothing about alcoholism, I just thought I'd sweat this thing out of my system. And I started doing push-ups and sit-ups every morning and every night. And you could have put a gun to my head and I would not drink. And that lasted for six weeks. And then the tablets ran out. And I found myself at a house party, ironically, on the 1st of January. You know, that's when the tablets ran out the day before. On the 1st of January, New Year's Day, I met ex-neighbours of ours that lived in a different part of Aberdeen. And the guy who was my age, he offered me a tin of beer. And still to this day, I can't describe how it tasted or what it did for me. But what I do know is that that first drink put me in denial of having any kind of problem whatsoever with alcohol for the next 12 years. You see, I must have got this idea in my head that for society to believe you're an alcoholic, given what the doctor had told me, you needed to be wearing a dirty raincoat, a bit of rope around your waist, drinking a, drinking a bottle or something, a brown paper bag under a bridge or in a graveyard somewhere. That was my perception or conception of the alcoholic 
you know, and I never got there yet by the grace of a higher power. So I went on my merry way, you know, I left school, I was I was in and out of many jobs. I was always a hard worker. I was like I say, my, my parents brought me up with good morals and principles and I could always do a hard day's work. But I had a terrible attitude problem, you see. I'd start a job on a Monday morning and if I wasn't managing director by Friday, I'd lose interest because I'd developed this ego. This really, my, my emotions were conflicted the whole time. I was always thinking I was better than everybody else or I was lower than everybody else. There was no equilibrium. There was no happy medium. And so I went, I went on my merry way, like I say, in and out of jobs. And I, I live in Aberdeen, and it's it's a big oil oil city. You know, oil's a big employer here in Aberdeen. Uh, not so much now, but certainly in the 80s when when the boom was going, you know, there were boom times in Aberdeen. And uh, I had some good jobs, but I would just... And the more money I earned, the more money I drank. It's just as simple as that, you know. I never had any kind of long-term plan. I uh, I just drifted. I was in and out of relationships. I was in and out of jobs. And I got the grand idea when I was 21 years old that I would go to Australia. I thought, the land of opportunity. I'll go away to the other side of the world, and life will be different. I can start a whole new life. But I went out there with a one-year work and holiday visa. And you kind of stay in Australia the rest of your life on a one-year work and all these. It doesn't work like that. And so I lasted 22 months in the immigration call with me and I had to come back to the UK, back home. And, of course, my mother was only ever delighted to see me, you know, when I went on my travels like that. And I worked away and I had different jobs. And then when I was 25, I went back to college. I thought that would be the next thing that would make a difference to my life and improve my life chances. I'll get some more bits of paper to say I'm not stupid. And uh, I did that. I did a two-year college course. But I never used a qualification. Um, I, I ended up going away down south to England with a sales team travelling from town to town, knocking on doors, cold canvassing, trying to generate leads that the salespeople could sell home security off of, you know. I lasted 10 weeks, and I'm on the phone to my mum. Oh, mum, it's no worked out. Can I come home? Of course you can, son, you know. And my dad knew that I was a worker. He knew that I always wanted to work. So there was never a gun put to my head saying, you've got to go out and get a job tomorrow. You can't stay here. He would say, come up, you know, take a couple of weeks, settle back in again, and we know you'll get a job. And, you know, so much love, so much love in the family home that I never respected. I never appreciated, you know. And as the years rolled by, I got resentful at my nearest and dearest, my own parents. I thought they were the source of a lot of my problems in life. And uh, I was so ill, and I didn't know it. I was so ill. And so it went on, and, and I have to say as well that my type of drinking, I was a weekend warrior. You see, I could work during the week, but the weekends were mine. And I went out, and I drank in the pubs and the clubs. But I have to tell you that my last drink was so different from my normal pattern of drinking. It was between 4 and 5 o'clock on a Wednesday morning, on the 10th of March, 1999. And it wasn't the biggest drink I'd ever had in my life, far from it. But I had two tins of beer, two tins of Budweiser. And I was, the last few years of my drinking, I used to drink bottles of Budweiser in, in the pubs and clubs. Bottle of Budweiser and a grouse whiskey chaser, grouse soda and ice. Now, grouse is a blended whiskey, you know, there's different whiskeys in it. I was never what we call a single malt whiskey drinker, which were, you know, which we have ample of here in Scotland. But the morning I had my last drink, I had these two, and I remember it was distinct, you know, different things stick in your mind. The bottles of Budweiser I bought in the bar were, were much smaller, but at that time, the supermarket or whatever was doing a promotion, and they had these 500 milliliter tins of Budweiser, half liter tins. So I had two of them in the fridge, and I had this little presentation gift box set, box of single malt whiskey miniatures that my mother had given me, three three of them, three little miniatures that I was never, ever going to drink because it was sentimental and it was very special to me. But I drank the whole lot rapidly. And I have to say, it didn't work. For the first time in my life, the alcohol did not work. And I was taken to that place that the book talks about where you think, you think we can no longer live with or without alcohol. 
and uh, pitiful and incomprehensible demoralisation, you know, terror, bewilderment, frustration, despair. I was just lost. I was completely lost. And I have to emphasise, I am not a religious person. And this is why this is so different for somebody like me, you know. But I want to read a wee bit for the big book because it always says it much better than I can. And that's that's why I chose the, the wording that I did for, my, for the poster for this meeting tonight, you know. It was only a matter of being willing to believe in a power greater than myself. Nothing more was required of me to make my beginning. Thus, I was, conv was I convinced that God is concerned with us humans when we want him enough. At long last, I saw, I felt, I believed. Scales of pride and prejudice fell from my eyes. A new world came into view. And that's what happened because I sought for the first of my life a power greater than me. I knew I was completely beaten and battered into the ground with alcohol. And that on my own power, I couldn't change things. So I needed a power greater than me and greater than alcohol in my life. And I asked that if there was a power for it to make, make me aware of it. And I know it's not everybody's experience, but, but I had a sudden upheaval type experience. It's described at the appendix of the back of the big book. And uh, I didn't have a blinding flash white light like Bill did in Towns Hospital, but otherwise it was fairly similar. And I saw and I felt and I believed. And I couldn't understand what had happened. A wave of peace came over me that's it's so profound I can't put it into words. And I remember going to bed and I slept like I'd never slept before in my life. And see, when I woke up, everything had changed. My attitude and outlook that absolutely everything had fundamentally changed. And I could not comprehend what had happened. I knew it was significant. I knew it was important. But I could not understand what had happened. And before I went to bed that night, I got down on my knees and I prayed. And I asked this, whatever it was I had connected with, this higher power, to show me the way, to give me its strength and guidance, and to never, ever leave me. Now, I know today that God's been with me all my life. I just blocked myself off from it, from him, from her, whatever it is, you know, this power, this power of love. Um, I blocked myself off with calamity, pomp, and worship of other things over years. But, but that night, I, I connected with something, you know. And the very next day, because I had, because I had shown just a sliver, just an absolute sliver of willingness, to believe in this power, he guided me into my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous the very next day. I just walked in off the street into a meeting of AA, and I didn't know what to expect. You know, I really, I went in there and I did not know. I did not know what was good, what, you know, but I was open-minded in this, and I, I was, willing, was willing to try something different. And I know today God guided me into that room. And then there wouldn't have been maybe even 10 people in the room, but they carried a message to me that day. For the first time in my life, I had found my tribe. I felt at home. I got a sense of belonging that I'd never had before in my life. And, you know, it was just, it was all serendipity. It was all part of God's plan. I was 30 hours away from my last drink. I had an honest and sincere desire never to drink again. And I never asked. I never got asked to share at that meeting either. It was the best thing that could have happened to Gordon. I was like a sponge. I just sat there and I, and I soaked it all in. And I got hope, you know. There was another guy there. They were all older. I was only 29 years old and they were all older than me. And, and I wasn't, you know. But God, again, was good. There was one other guy at the meeting. He's the same age as me. And it was his first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. He had been going to another fellowship for two weeks, but this was his first AA meeting. So I, I didn't feel alone, you know. And I got tremendous hope. And they said, keep coming back. You know, they explained the illness. They said that we have a physical allergy, a phenomenon of craving. When we take our drink, we have no control over the amount we take. And I thought, yeah, that's been me from the age of 15. But they said, more importantly, it centers in the mind. We have a mental obsession that tells us that we can control our drinking once we start. And I'd never been able to do that. But I have to say, I was very ignorant. I was very arrogant. 
and I was very ill, you know, and I read the 12th step on the scrolls and I thought, yeah, I've had my awakening because I didn't hear other people sharing my particular type of experience. And so I thought you guys needed the 12 steps to achieve, to experience what I had that morning, you know. I was so ill and I didn't know it. But I did lots of meetings. I came to a meeting every day for at least the first six months. I got a home group within three weeks. I did every meeting in Aberdeen within three weeks because I had been signed off my work at that period. I, was, I wasn't too well and I had the opportunity to go to every meeting in Aberdeen within three weeks. I got a home group, but I did not want to change, you know. And I knew I was an alcoholic, but I was just a little alcoholic. <laughs> and I didn't need all these steps. You know, I was so ill. And uh, for any newcomers in the room, please don't take as long as I did to get a sponsor and embrace the program in its entirety. I sat around meetings for four years, not drinking, going to lots of meetings every morning before, every night before I went to bed, thanking this higher power for another sober day. You know, I was stark, raving, sober with untreated alcoholism. And I don't recommend it for anybody, you know. Um, so four years in, what actually motivated me to, to do what's suggested is the mental obsession came back. I got a free ride for four years. Never thought about it, didn't desire it, didn't want it. Went to lots of meetings, you know. But four years in, the mental obsession came back. And I almost wanted to drink more than I wanted to breathe but I knew I couldn't. And more importantly, I didn't want to. Now, I could have I could have went out there, choices, four years in the rooms. I could have went out there and started drinking it again and been dead many years ago. I could have you know, decided to take my own life without even drinking because I couldn't cope with what was going on in there. But thankfully, I made the right decision. I did not drink again. And God put a guy in my path whom I asked for help. You see, I had a major issue with steps four and five. There were things that I had done that I was never going to tell anybody. And, yeah, issues issues with trust, you know. But this guy was put in my path, and I approached him one night. After hearing him sharing two or three different meetings, I didn't ask him straight away. But I asked him for help with the program, and he said, yes, Gordon, I'll help you, you know. And I set about doing the work. You know, I took my inventory and I realized I wasn't the person I thought I was. But it, more importantly, it gave me the information I needed to change. You know, I got down to the causes and conditions and the exact nature of my wrongs. And he gave me advice as to where it was appropriate to make amends, you know, to people I'd hurt. And what a journey, you know. I came out of my, I, I was so ill, I have to say this, you know, again, for for the newcomers, get a hold of somebody you feel you can trust and share with them. Share with them all the stuff that blocks you, blocks you from whatever your own conception of this higher power may, may or may come to be. And I remember the first night I sat down with this guy and I had, I was so frightened, I was so insecure about myself. And I said to this guy, I said, I'm going to tell you something I've done, which was the biggest, baddest thing I thought I'd ever done. And I says, you might not want to be my sponsor once I've told you it. But of course, he shared things that he had done with me and he helped me get what I had done into perspective, you know. And I can remember some nights walking out his house, feeling like I was walking about 18 inches off the ground. The freedom, the freedom that comes when we share all this stuff, it, it kept me sick anyway, you know. And that's why I walk a free man today. I have no guilt, shame, or remorse attached to anything I've ever done in my life because I've shared it. And as I, as I go on through my journey in recovery, I keep sharing it because things bubble up, you know. I, I'm no saint. We seek spiritual progress, not spiritual perfection. And I've made mistakes. Let me tell you, I've made mistakes in my journey. And there's been times when all I've been doing right is not drinking. You know, this is a filthy, rotten, stinking illness which wants us dead. But I don't want that, and my higher power doesn't want that. So I've, I've tried to practice this stuff on a daily basis, you know. Um, 
I love the step 10, you know, we can we continue to take personal inventory. And I'm, I'm going to read a wee bit for the book about step 11, because I love it. And it's something I try to practice. Page 86, on awakening, let us think about the 24 hours ahead. We consider our plans for the day. Before we begin, we ask God to direct our thinking, especially asking that it to be, be divorced from self-pity, dishonest or self-seeking motives. And here's a promise. A lot of us in AA know about the step nine promises, the step 11, step 10 promises. There's promises throughout this book, many, many promises. And here's one of them. Under these conditions, we can employ our mental faculties with assurance. I'd never done that in my life before I came to AA. For after all, God gave us brains to use. Our thought life will be placed on a much higher plane when our thinking is cleared of wrong motives. You know, And I've also been involved in service at various levels in the fellowship. And this is an infinite way of living and expanding and evolving in recovery. You know, there's no end to this stuff, providing I keep practicing it. I love that word in the 12th step, practice these principles in all our affairs, because I don't always get things right. I'll never get a PhD in recovery. I am no soberologist. I get a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition, you know. And I love my life today. I love this way of life. The AA way is the easier, softer way, you know. I went through my journey in recovery and have met some wonderful ple people and been to some wonderful places, you know. A big thing for me in recovery, I still have this wanderlust <laughs> that I had that brought me to Australia when I was 21, and I love to travel, and I've been blessed and Truly blessed to go to conventions, AA conventions, not just here in the UK, but abroad as well, you know. And um, we all have adversities and challenges in our life. And the program, I have found that when things happen that give me a wee bit of turmoil or unease or I'm not sure, you know, I just try to do the next right thing, you know. I don't drink, I get through it. And see, when I come out the other side, I'm then better equipped to handle the next hurdle which comes along in my, in my journey because they will come that's life in life's terms you know and and a biggie for me in my recovery you know my my mum was diagnosed with, with cancer in March 2019 and she got nearly a well approximately a full year um um and the 23rd of March 2020 here in the UK the first lockdown came in and everybody was told stay at home Four days later, the 27th of March, 2020, my mum died. And I couldn't get to meetings. But lo and behold, God and AA will always find a way. And the Zoom meetings just exploded. You know, and I was going to meetings all over the world, you know. And I've met people I would never have met on the Zoom had it not been for COVID. You know, so God has always got a plan. I just have to try and attune myself and tap into this power and allow him to show me the way, you know. And um, I, I got I got a home group on the Zoom. Um, like I say, I'll, I'll put the details in the chat to the to the MMT group, the, the hosts and co-hosts, and anybody can get the details from then. Uh, Tuesday night, we do a big book study, and Thursday night, we have a general share. And another meeting that I've just started, and this is how, this is how it works. You know, for years, I've done prayer and meditation on my own. I've done it when I went in retreats and that with other alcoholics as well, but predominantly on my own. And three weeks ago, yesterday, lo and behold, on one of the Facebook or WhatsApp groups I'm in, here was details of a morning meditation Zoom meeting. Now, it only lasts 35 minutes. Now, it's UK time, but it's quarter to seven in the morning till 20 past seven. And they do all the readings, all the prayers, and there's even a 10-minute med meditation in the middle. And some mornings, there's been nearly, well, more than what there is in the meeting just now, in the guts of 100 people in the meeting. And what a way to start the day with so many other people in recovery. And it's open to all fellows, this particular meeting, open to all fellows in recovery. And, you know, try to improve, improve my conscious contact, improve because I'll never get it right. I'll never get it 100%, but I have an, an opportunity on a daily basis to improve it. 
because another we've lots of slogans in AA, lots of sayings, you know, and one of them is beyond your wildest dreams, you know. Well, if I'm giving you my truth, I don't want what's beyond my wildest dreams. Why? Because what God has in store for me is beyond anything I can imagine. And I'm not talking about material things. Yes, they make our lives very, they make our lives more comfortable. But I'm talking about the internal stuff at my very core, how I feel about me, about other people in the world in general. That is so far removed from how it used to be when I was out there performing, running on self-will, you know, a tornado, just completely ripping my way through other people's lives. No consideration, no thought for how my behavior and actions and what I said hurt other people, you know. And I try not to live like that today. It's a completely different way of life. Completely different way of life. And last summer, the convention started again, and I've been back into conventions, you know, for a guy who was a hopeless, helpless alcoholic, this year already, I've done 380 conventions. I've got another four lined up between now and the end of May. And I'm not bragging or boasting. I'm asking myself, how did that happen? For a hopeless, helpless alky like me, how did that happen? You know, um, the gifts, the gifts are just, they're too many, you know. But I, all I have is right here, right now, you know. The capacity and the ability to just live in the here and the now. That's a gift, you know. I was always remorseful and guilt and shame about the stuff in the past, or fearful of the future. It's not like that today. But it is contingent on following a few simple steps every day. You see, because every day I'm not drinking. My illness is in the gym doing push-ups and sit-ups, keeping itself really, really fit, waiting for me to stop doing the things that I know are good for me, you know? Um, wow, what, what, what a journey, what a journey, you know? Um, I'll, I'll just say one last thing before I, I try and wind things up for you. Um, I hurt a lot of people, you know, when I was out there performing. And I remember... Uh, when I was 21, I have a cousin who's just a few weeks younger than me and lives up in a different part of Scotland. It's a set of islands north of Scotland. There's Orkney Islands and Shetland Islands. And, and my father's originally from the Orkney Islands. And, and one of my cousins was having a 21st birthday party, you know. And I had a good job in the oil at the time, but I was lucky. I got a few days off over a long weekend and I went up and I set off. We used to stay with my, my grandparents, you know. And I, and I set off out early that evening. I was all dressed to the nines, had my best clothes on, but I couldn't, it wasn't a case of going out with my parents and going down to the party, you know? No, no, I had to go out early and get a few in me, get started, get a head start. And I found this dingy wee pub, you know? And I went in there and I, I didn't have a partner to go to the, this function with, but this this lady was there, you know? And, and, I, and I took her to the to the party and, I'm not going to describe what she was wearing, you know, but she may or may not have been somebody that, um, well, I don't want to go there. <laughs> but I'll give you I'll give you a picture, right? <laughs> just a, a little hint of what was going on here. And I took her to the party and I just embarrassed myself. I embarrassed my family, you know, and I ended up leaving early. You know, I was drunk and I was with somebody that none of the family knew and the way she was dressed and everything, people probably got all sorts of weird and wonderful ideas, you know, what was going on. Well, nothing like that did happen, <laughs> by the way. Nothing like that. I was just what in company, you know. Um, and that very same lassie, I mean, I made amends to that cousin many years ago. You know, I I, I specifically, as part of my, my step nine, making amends, make, made direct amends, you know. Now, that same cousin for a few years now, has come down to Aberdeen because she's married, she has two young daughters, and they do dancing, a particular kind of dancing. I don't know what kind of dancing it is, but they come to Aberdeen because there's an annual event in February every year, and she wants me to spend time with them. She wants me to be in their company, you know? This is what this program has given me. People who I really, really hurt and embarrassed in the past, they want me in their company today. And it so happens she's down this weekend, and I'm going tomorrow, and I'll be playing 10 pin bowling with them and having a meal with them. You know, the miracles that can happen. 
the changes that can take place when I do what the guy that took me through the program, one of the one of the things he used to say, Gordon, if you do the right things, the right things will happen. And that's been my experience. So I want to wish each and every one of you that's in this meeting well on your journey in recovery. And I'll thank everybody who's doing service. I'm glad to be here and sober. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.